Good morning. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and look at verses 38 to 42 this morning, the story of Martha and Mary is so Christocentric and so attainable to each one of us. And so as you turn there, let's um, pray for our time together that the Lord would bless it. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for the great hope that we have in Christ, that our chains are gone. And the penalty of our sin has been removed and the power of our sin has been broken. And now we walk with you as new creatures free in Christ to live holy lives, to pursue holiness in Christ by your spirit. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit to guide us into the truth of your word. And so we ask this morning as we come that you would do just that, that you would teach us and remind us, refresh us, build us up in Christ, strengthen our faith that we might serve you in more faithful ways. God, thank you for the weakness in each of us that causes us to cry out to you that you would do this good work of changing our hearts and and growing us up in in Christ this morning. God, do that for your glory. Do that for for our good and our conformity this morning to the Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Luke relates this story that occurs one day when Martha invites Jesus to her home. And the account is somewhat vague. It doesn't mention the village, though we know later that it's Bethany. It doesn't mention the timing. It just comes after the Good Samaritan. It's just as they were traveling along, they encountered Martha and, and received an invitation to have a meal at her house. And what I want us to see this morning is that each person involved in this small little context had a plan. And that plan revealed each of their hearts. And if we pay, a cl- if we pay, excuse me, if we pay close attention to this text, it will reveal our heart. We'll examine each person's plan as our outline this morning. And so first, Martha had a plan. Martha had a plan that tragically missed the point, and so Jesus confronted her plan. Martha is the sister of Mary and the sister of Lazarus, who isn't mentioned in this text, but we know later in John 11. And they lived in Bethany, about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And Martha is portrayed in this account as the leader of things. Maybe the older sister. She takes the lead, and that's a good thing sometimes. Here she takes on the role of hostess to do something special for Jesus, to prepare a meal for him and welcome him into her her home, perhaps to rest and be refreshed, perhaps to meet him for the first time and spend time with him. Maybe after the preparations of the meal were completed. We don't know what Martha knew about Christ in this setting, but there was something that caused her to invite him to come to her home. And I think it's fair to say that Jesus was well known wherever he went after he began his earthly ministry. The things that he was doing were amazing. Lots of miracles. And the things that he was saying about himself were amazing claiming to be the the Messiah, to be God himself. 
And so just listen to this account in Matthew 4.23 of the, the growing fame of Christ. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And even without social media, the word of Christ, the, 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 the mystery of who is this man, is spreading all over the land. There was a lot of Jesus talk. And so not knowing exactly what Martha knows about Jesus, it's probably fair that she knew, to say that she knew something. There was some reason that caused her to invite him into her home and serve him a meal. It's a good goal, isn't it, to serve. But it's a dangerous thing to serve. Because with all service, there is an inherent temptation in the service. With serving comes expectations of what that time will look like, of how it will transpire, of the nature of the time and the effect of the time, and how much work is required for that service, and maybe even the assumption that others need to join into that service. Growing up, my dad used to say of my mom that she was the hostess with the mostess. And I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I think Martha desired here in this context to be the hostess with the mostess. And so the text jumps from the invitation to Jesus immediately sitting in her home being served. Where Martha's expectations would be revealed. Which one of us, when we are serving or working, does not in some way assume that everyone around us should be working as well. And so my expectations bleed over into other people's lives. Expectations are like a passenger train with mandatory boarding. You have to get on board. My expectations are pulling out of the station. You have to get on board with me. Wives, who has ever stood in the kitchen laboring over the dishes and wondering how your husband could possibly not know what you're doing in the kitchen. Does he not see? Does he not hear? Even as you bang the dishes together harder to, to give him the idea that something's transpiring in the kitchen. How could he possibly not see that I'm working and it's time, it's obvious that it's time for you to be working too. I don't think the male eardrum hears the frequency of dishes banging in the kitchen. <laughs> Martha was convinced of her appraisal of the situation. I'm slaving and Mary's sitting. Surely Jesus will understand this. Surely Jesus will get on my side. And so with our agenda and our plan, we not only self-justify, we invoke God to our side, to validate our agenda. If God was here, he'd obviously call the world into submission to my agenda. The beauty of this text is that God was there, and he did no such thing. Martha fully embraced the role of servant, servant with expectations, to the extent that as her expectations were not met, she would become frustrated, frustrated even with Jesus. She would complain and grumble to God himself for the failure of things to pan out the way that she envisioned them. Does that sound familiar in life? It should. This is the very expression of the sinful heart. It's the nature of the remaining sin within us, even as Christians, even as believers. I read this text and I think, well, there I am. Thanks, Martha. That's exactly the way I feel. Pushing my agenda, frustrated with people who don't get on board with what I want, when I want, and how I want. And agenda is too kind of a word. I'm just pushing my own sinfully selfish desires in life. Listen to James 4.1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? 
You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And here's the sneakiness of Martha's pleasures that waged war in her heart. They were concealed in a package that looked like the desire to serve the living Christ. But to do so in her, from her way, to do it her way, from the vantage point of self and missing the opportunity of opportunities that was there before her. But before we dive in and explore a little bit more of Martha's plan, I want us to, in, in a sense, defend her behavior, if for a moment, and not, not in a finally justifying way. She, she is corrected. She needs to be corrected. But, but I think there's some key elements that we can overlook Martha invited Jesus Christ into her home. She welcomed him in, she, she called him Lord, and she served him. And so I want to ask you, and I want you to think about when Jesus comes to visit, what do you serve? What's enough for Jesus? It's definitely not peanut butter and jelly time. When Jesus Christ comes to, to eat in your house, or at least it doesn't appear that that's fitting for the occasion. And so before we criticize Martha, and this text does, I want you to think about if I warned you in one hour, Jesus Christ would be at your home to eat, to dine. What would you serve him? How much, how much preparation would be enough? What kind of food, what kind of side dishes, desserts, what kind of cutlery, what kind of furniture, tablecloth? How long should you prepare? Should you walk out right now? Because you, we usually entertain according to the weight of who comes to dinner. And so we, we say things like um, paper plates or china. Oh, it's, it's just the so-and-sos. It's paper plates. <laughs> How do you say that when Jesus Christ is coming to eat in your house? Honey, it's fine. Just order some pizzas. It's just the second person of the Trinity. <laughs> it's just the one who made us, who sustains our life. It's just the God-man who is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. You, you can't say that about Christ. What would be enough to meet your expectations of Christ coming to eat at your house? And what would meet your, expe your expectations of what his expectations would be? What amount of time of preparation would be enough? What makes this text so fascinating, and, and Jesus' response to Martha's preparation so much more powerful, is his response is, I don't need and I don't want what you think I want. What the world wants thinks I want, what you personally think I want. Jesus desires something far greater from us than a good meal prepared well. And in reality, he desires to give something far greater and more precious to us. Jesus could have called legions of angels to come and prepare a meal that would have delighted the taste buds beyond our wildest imaginations. He could simply speak into existence preparations and food that would infinitely outweigh anything that Martha could conceive of or prepare and put on the table. But he didn't. And in these moments, he doesn't want Martha's culinary service to him. He didn't want what Martha wanted to give him. And so I think it's a fair question. Could it be this morning that you, that me, that I could be giving something and striving really hard to give something to Christ that he doesn't even want? Commentator Hendrickson says, There are things which in excellence and importance far surpass eating. Martha had a plan, and it went like this. She planned to welcome Jesus into her home. Martha's plan was lots of preparations, getting ready. Her plan was a quality of presentation that required a lot of serving, so much that one person couldn't do it all, or one person couldn't do it all fast enough to get to the feet of Jesus, if that was her goal. Leon Morris says, Life has few real necessities. 
we can do without much on which we lavish time. Her plan was to make this happen, no matter the cost, no matter the loss, to stay the course, to the extent that somewhere in the process, as she, realized she, need, as she realizes that she needs Mary's assistance, and Jesus hasn't acted according to her expectation, the text says that she confronts Christ. She comes up to him physically, confronts him with her presence and her words. And maybe by implication, confronts Mary if she, if she hears Martha addressing Christ. And she rebukes Jesus. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. This isn't right. This isn't fair, Jesus. This isn't proper. And so I need a little help here from you. I need justice, equity. That's all I need here is just a little equity. It's only right that Mary would help. Me. We can put the best motive on Martha. Even if, even if her ultimate desire would be to get to the feet of Christ and hear his words, and, and her rebuke still comes up horribly, horribly short. Could a worse question ever be asked of Jesus Christ? The, the combination of words that Martha puts together and that come out of her mouth in proximity to Christ perhaps, is the worst question that could ever be asked of Christ in the universe. She's asking Jesus Christ, do you not care? Is that not a very real and very telling question that we ask in our hearts sometimes? Maybe far too often. She wasn't the only one in the Bible to ask it in Mark 4.38. Jesus is asleep in the boat as the waves are crashing in. The disciples wake him up and they ask him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? When the reality is, no one cares more. No one cares more than Jesus Christ about everyone and everything. We can only begin to fathom the depths of the care and concern and compassion of Christ Jesus invented caring. This is the God-man, and he is love. And his care knows no end. And Martha's eyes are on her serving and her plans and her agenda, and she's blind to who this person is. Wondering if Jesus cares. This morning, are, are things not working out the way that you planned them? And according to your agenda, and is there some possibility that you're even wrestling with, does does God care? Does Jesus care about this? Because it's not going the way I think it ought to go. And the implication of Mary's question, or Martha's question, is if you care, prove it by doing what I ask you. Martha is calling into question the very character of God. And really, what's she really asking? She's she's asking, Lord, don't you care about my agenda, about my appraisal of things? And that is a very backdoor, sneaky declaration of of Godhood. It's a self-declaration of divinity. When we sum up our situation and we say, God, you don't care, we are assuming something incredible about ourselves. If you would just let me rule for a moment, Jesus, I could do better. And that's sin, and that's unbelief, and yet sometimes we wonder if God cares. Jesus was caring for Martha. He was caring in not giving her what she wanted. The vindication, the self-justification, even the help. He kept that from her. His care was for her to have something infinitely better. Jesus would prove to Martha and Mary just how much he cared when he would weep tears of sadness in John 11 when their brother Lazarus died. He would care for them when he would raise Lazarus from the dead simply by calling him forth from the tomb. The God of the universe cares so much. His care is so much greater than we can even imagine 
that he invites us and he commands us to bring every single one of our cares and entrust them to him. And the reason that he gives when he tells us to bring our cares to him is that he cares for us. 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. His care, the care of Christ, the care of God can swallow up all my cares. His care can embrace and remedy and calm every fear, every insecurity, every guilt, every wound and hurt and uncertainty in this life and the life to come. It, it's like the imagery in my mind is like a big black hole that just sucks in stars and they're never to be seen again. The love of God, the care of God is so big and so powerful. If we would entrust our cares to him, he swallows them up and he takes them and he affirms to us that he loves us perfectly in Christ. He's a caring God, a kind and compassionate God. Jesus would prove once and for all just how much he cares to Martha, to Mary, to you and to me at the cross. That answers it for us once and for all. When he would lay down his very life and take upon himself our sins and die. And pay the penalty of eternal hell on our behalf to set us free forever. And to purchase that forgiveness that we could not purchase on our own. So that we could stand before God. And he did it through the spilling of his own blood. How he cares for us. May we never question the care of Christ. And may the power and the clarity of the cross keep answering that question for us. Does he care? Oh, he cared there. He'll care here. When we question the heart of God, we, we testify to how little we can still think of the cross. And so we need to consider it often. And we need to consider his love and sacrifice on Calvary often. So that we will quickly reject the very notion that Jesus does not care. He cares about what's going on in Martha's home. He cares about choosing the best part. He cares about each one of us personally and perfectly. He cares about every detail of your life right now, in this very moment, including preeminently whether or not your sins are forgiven. He cares preeminently right now about your eternity. And whether or not you have come to Christ and you have received the free offer of the gospel. Jesus cares, but Jesus never caters. He never yields to our will and our desires and our agendas and our selfishness. And we're thankful for that. I'm thankful that Jesus doesn't cater to me. It's what vindicates him as the holy God, perfectly righteous. He will not rebuke Mary. He won't turn to Mary and say, you know, your, your sister's right. Why, why don't you get up and get to work? Maybe we can talk later. Martha's plan tragically missed the point of who was in her house and what he ultimately desired for her. Mary had a plan as well. Mary had a plan that surprisingly got the point. And Jesus affirmed and defended her decision. Her plan was simply this, to sit at the Lord's feet. Her plan was to listen to Jesus' words. This was the posture of a disciple in that day, to sit at the feet as a learner, as a follower. And the fact that Jesus accepts Mary at his feet and that she's a woman is, is in stark contrast to first century practices and, and the low view of women. Rabbis didn't accept women at their feet in the position of disciple which speaks volumes to the value and the equality of women. This, this just as sure as Mary is sitting at the feet of Christ, Jesus affirms and values every woman. In contrast to our culture, and men, we, we better follow suit. We, we better learn and, and characterize our interactions with women as that of Christ, affirming their value and their equality here in being a disciple of Christ. Mary's plan was to do nothing else. Nothing else but sit and listen. 
Verse 39 is so matter of fact. Look, look there with me. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. It feels, it feels strange to say this, but there is a time not to serve. There is a time here in the presence of Jesus Christ where there's something better than even serving Jesus Christ. She's doing nothing. And it, but in some sense, she's doing everything. She's doing everything necessary here for this moment. What looks so passive is so rich and so active and vibrant. So I, I want us to, to dial in. What is Mary doing? She's seizing the opportunity, some moments with Jesus. Jesus describes it as the one thing, the one numerical thing, and he affirms it and he protects it. And so we need to affirm it and we need to protect it as well. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the words of Christ. She's receiving, she's learning, she's yielding, honoring, seeking. She's believing that this one thing is better than all other things in this very moment. And so she's focused on doing nothing else but hearing Christ. And faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And so she's in the position to either begin faith or, begin, or build on faith. She's there to have faith for the first time or for her faith to be grown up. The best part that she's choosing is the best person. The source of those words, the Lord Jesus Christ. What she's not doing, she's not working, she's not worrying, striving, she's not frustrated, She's not busy, distracted. She's not caught up in any agenda except listening to Christ. And at least for these moments, she's not fighting for self, but she's surrendering and sitting and choosing the best part. Jesus says, I won't take that away from her. In this context of Martha's house and in the greater context of eternity, the the idea is that those who choose Christ never lose Christ. I'm not going to take away Mary's choice to sit and listen. And in the gospel, those who come to Christ, you'll never lose him. He promises that. He validates that all through the text. You will never lose Christ if you choose him by faith. Jesus had a plan as well. Jesus had a plan to bless these two women, to do them good, to love them perfectly. His plan was to speak with Mary sitting at his feet and affirm her choice of him over serving and then defend that choice. And he had a plan to confront Martha with a life-changing rebuke that she desperately needed in those moments. On one hand, we could think, Martha's doing her best. She's serving really hard. Shouldn't she be applauded in these moments? Some are listening. Some are serving. But Jesus, in, in this context, he loves her too much to leave her in that state. He loves her perfectly, so he speaks directly to the nature of her service. Because it's often in our service that God addresses key issues in our heart. Doing good things. That, that's often where our heart is most revealed. Motives, intent, the things that are deep. Verse 41, But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus says, I will not end these moments for your agenda. And by implication, he's inviting Martha into those moments. Mary has chosen the best thing. You choose the best thing. And his rebuke is so, it's so arresting if we step back and think about what is exactly, what is Jesus really saying to Martha? Stop doing nice things for me. In place of, instead of coming to me and communing with me and sitting here and listening to the words of Christ. Stop replacing Christ with service to Christ. Stop throwing him effort instead of seeking his face. And so he says, Martha, Martha, stop. And sit down and be quiet and cease striving and come to me. Jesus is addressing their decisions. Two women make two different decisions in this context. But ultimately, he's affirming to us in this context who he truly is. The text is not so much a commentary on decisions of two women 
as it is a powerful declaration of the infinite value of Christ, of the supremacy and excellency of Christ, the best part, the one thing necessary among all other things. What do we find when we choose the best thing? Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, and it even seems to echo to this context. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why do we so often not come to Christ? In those quiet hours of the morning, in our hectic times during the day, why do we not find ourselves more consistently at the feet of Christ? Not doing, but beholding and choosing the best part. Remember Peter's confession in John 6? After Jesus declared himself the bread of life, that you must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have eternal life. And his disciples grumbled at this. They said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to this? And then, then Jesus went even further. And he affirmed that the only way a person could come to him is if it had been granted them by the Father. And the result of that context is that many people start leaving. Many followers of Christ depart Christ. They, they, they go away. And Jesus asked the twelve, at the end of John 6, you do not want to go away also, do you? And Peter's response is, it's our heart, really. It's our heart as believers. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are everything. You are the one thing necessary, the best part. Where else can we go? And yet we find ourselves going and leaving and wandering Peter says, where else can we go? And Martha says, here in our context, I'll be in the kitchen serving, preparing and working. I'll serve. Do you see see here the possibility of serving apart from Christ? In a way that overshadows Christ, that misses Christ, even though hands are busy and things are getting done, our life can seem like a vicious cycle of feet of Christ kitchen, feet of Christ, kitchen. But hear the tender rebuke of Christ this morning. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Are you worried and bothered this morning? Anxious and disturbed about so many things, so many even good things that parade around like absolute necessities and yet they keep us from Christ. They rob us of the rest for our souls that we so so passionately want and so often find ourselves headed to the kitchen. And so the simple application is to believe Christ this morning. What an incredibly freeing truth that he gives us in this context. There's only one thing I need. It's him. But what about the thousand other things I have to worry about in this life? Jesus still says, there's only one thing you need. Just me, just me to save you, just me to sanctify you, just me to heal your broken heart with my perfect love, just me to lead you through temptation, just me in life, just me in death. If you don't know Christ this morning, if you're you're not a Christian, you don't have assurance and confidence that Christ is yours, you're always in the kitchen, in the service to self. Completely apart from Christ, not serving God, but serving your sin, your agenda. And Jesus calls you out of the kitchen. He calls you to stop your sinful, selfish, godless agenda and to come and listen and hear the words of Christ and repent and to come to Him for life and stop trying to find it in the kitchen. To come and believe the free offer of the gospel and the timing is always right now. What could possibly be more important than this? Will you give yourself to earning more money in this life that will profit you nothing in judgment 
no matter what the stock market does, you are going to die. And you will stand before this God. Will you keep working on your body to keep it healthy and fit, all the while the wrath of God remains on you? Will you keep chasing after the world and staying late at the office for that promotion, but not knowing if you don't make it home tonight and this is the night that you die, you still don't know where you would spend eternity? Jesus says, sit down and listen and hear the words of eternal life that save sinful, agenda-filled, rebellious sinners like us. The commentator Linsky says, Where this is chosen, the best thing, all else follows. Where this is set aside and neglected, all else is useless, empty, deceptive, and vain. Don't go another minute, don't go another day without reckoning with the reality of the gospel. And the Jesus who's calling you to himself that you might have life. Christian, does this mean that we're to live perpetually in a passive state of listening and receiving and never get up from the feet of Christ? Some have used this to justify sort of the, the removed sort of monastic life. And you hear people say things like, well, you just can't sit around and read your Bible all day. You have to live. But rightly understood, this context rightly understood, it's our time at his feet that enables and empowers our time in the kitchen of life. Your serving will never be right serving until you've spent that time choosing the best thing. Faithful hearers will most certainly be faithful doers. And for us, we have it so much better than Mary and Martha. We're on this side of the cross. And so it's not, really, it's not even an either-or question for us in the Christian life. You and I are not deciding, do I serve or go sit at the feet of Jesus? Because Jesus tells us to abide in him all the time. He's taken up residence in our, in our very souls. Paul tells, tells the Colossians in, three, in Colossians 3.15, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you all the time. Christ is always with us. I can always sit at the feet of Christ. We need never serve in a Christless manner and leave his feet. It's the promise of the new covenant that he's in us and he leads us and he he invites us to abide in him. And so for the new covenant Christian, the kitchen and the feet of Christ have been forever merged through the gospel. We're never left to choose between the two. The best part is always available to us. Christ is always near. Just give us four concluding thoughts. These are sort of, I guess, application. The first is this. Through the gospel, by God's grace, Mary's choice is my choice. Mary's choice is your choice. If, if, if you're a Christian, the, the, the Spirit of God has taken away the veil and you've seen Christ and you've agreed with Mary, I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to believe. Second, through the gospel, by God's grace, all my Martha moments are forgiven. There are a lot of Martha moments. We are wandering kitchen kind of people. And yet yet Christ calls us here to him. All my Martha moments are forgiven. Thirdly, through the gospel, by God's grace, he's changing me. He's changing you to see more and more that there really is only one thing necessary. And everything else is sort of falling away. New things come up, but we have to address that too. New things get in front of us to distract us, and we have to apply by faith this principle. There's only one thing I need. What about this? What about that? What about this? I just need Christ. And there's a winnowing of the heart as we narrow in on this one thing necessary. And then fourthly and finally, through the gospel... By God's grace, there is a time coming when the best thing will be the only thing. When this life will have passed away, and with it the battle with remaining sin, and all will be made new, and we will see the face of Christ, and that desire to always choose the best thing, to always choose Christ, it will be fulfilled and permanent. And nothing will ever take us away 
really from the feet of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your instruction to Martha and to Mary. God, we desire above all else to choose the best part, the one thing necessary. Thank you uh, by your spirit. You have given that to your people. You have given us Christ. And Father, it's our desire to grow in this, to, to labor in this by faith, to be convinced more and more there's just one thing I need in this life, and it's Christ. And if I have him, it's enough. God, help us in that. Grow us up in him. Thank you for your word, the power of your spirit to do that in us. And so we, we keep walking with great confidence that you are doing this in us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.